After the release of Super Monkey Ball 2, GameCube users had it pretty good. And it seemed like Amusement Vision were really hitting their stride with the series, being able to balance arcadey fun with the content of a home console game. Is it time to hit it out of the park with the third entry? Well, not exactly, as the series would lay somewhat dormant with major console entries in 2003 and 2004. But in 2005, we'd see not just one, but two more entries, with one being a compilation of Super Monkey Ball 1 and 2 on the Xbox and PlayStation. Not only would the other platforms get their turn to ball it up, but it was a chance for Amusement Vision, now remerged back into Sega, to create the definitive Monkey Ball experience before moving the series forward, applying everything they'd learned from the first two and streamlining the experience to get the most out of a spectacular roster of levels. This was a lot of people's first exposure to the series, but how well does it compare to the GameCube games nowadays? Does it accurately and effectively preserve the base game while having reasons to double dip like any good definitive port should? Well, that's precisely what we're about to find out. Super Monkey Ball Deluxe rolled onto the Xbox and PS2 in 2005. It's essentially Super Monkey Ball 2 in terms of framework, content, and UI, but adds all the levels from the first game on top of some brand new levels and reworked pacing. What we have is two great GameCube games combined into one super game, ported to both the most powerful and least powerful console of the generation. I've heard claims that a cancelled Super Monkey Ball 3 was reworked into Deluxe due to a trademark and logo filed by Sega in 2002 and rumored to be announced in 2003. However, nothing ever came of the title. As of 2004, Nagoshi stated that Super Monkey Ball 3 would most certainly happen, but by the time 2006 came around, he denied the rumors. Whether or not he was originally referring to Deluxe or Banana Crazy is hard to say, and regardless, Deluxe was ultimately the final product. But what we got was what many consider a third game in the trilogy, as Deluxe still feels like its own game in many ways, for better or for worse. Sega ports in this generation were kind of all over the place, and Super Monkey Ball Deluxe is no different. Although aesthetically simple, 1 and 2 were pretty good looking GameCube games for how flawlessly they ran. The simple geometry was polished and detailed with animated backgrounds and high quality effects. So when a game like this gets ported to a higher-end console and a lower-end one, you get the standard 6th gen Sega port. Which brings me to the PS2 version, which is littered with issues. Not only does it lack progressive scan over component, a highlight of SMB2, but many of the actual graphics were downscaled as well. No reflections, which makes stages look super unpolished, some levels even remove background assets killing the atmosphere. And I'm assuming the PS2 couldn't run Bonus Wave for some reason because the effect is jarringly shrunk. The game is capped at 30fps and doesn't just have loading times between stages, but loading times when picking a level on the map. Pacing screeches to a halt here folks, and the game feels held together by mere strings and glue. For a 6th gen game that ran out a consistent 60 with no loading times, the standard should be much higher for a PS2 port. But this just plays horribly. Performance is paramount for a precision game like this, and the PS2 version is super clunky to navigate and play. The downscaling here is disgraceful, and not in a cute way like Junior was. At least that game was impressive. If you play Super Monkey Ball Deluxe, please don't play the PS2 version. <laughs> Just don't. Luckily, the Xbox version is playable. 60fps, 480p, widescreen, and probably the most accessible way to get the highest resolution because of its backwards compatibility on the Xbox 360, which outputs the game natively via HDMI and cleans up the image pretty well. It also doesn't have loading times and preserves the original experience much more as a result. It's actually pretty mundane because it's basically just like the GameCube version, but I have to stress it given the botched PS2 port. However, it's not perfect. There are some frame drops here and there, which is more of a nitpick, but is worth noting given how solid performance on the GameCube was. Outside of the console-specific porting job, Deluxe in general has some presentation quirks. The biggest issue is that the in-game GameCube cutscenes are now fuzzy FMVs, which just reeks of laziness. What's worse, however, is that the text boxes of the cutscenes are rendered in real time and placed on top of the FMVs, maybe to make it more readable. Now, on PS2 and original Xbox, this would be fine, but some big problems arise on the 360 as the original Xbox emulation isn't the best. It doesn't affect the gameplay in this game, but for certain other games there can be glitches and occasionally lag. 
In Monkey Ball Deluxe, the pre-rendered cutscenes, being video files, seem to run fine, but there seems to be some kind of delay with the text boxes. As a result of this desync, characters say the wrong dialogue, and the story is drastically different. What we get is an Xbox 360 exclusive plot that feels a little more raunchy and even edgy at times. The chant has been absolutely butchered, and Ai has basically snapped and gone off the rails in this plot. Everyone is clearly high on something. Some dialogue actually kind of works, but creates unintentionally hilarious comedic timing. My playthrough of Deluxe's story mode felt like watching a train wreck unfold. On one hand, it's very out of character, but on the other, they feel more like real monkeys. This was either my disc or an emulation bug, but it consistently happened and shows the greater issue of using cheap FMVs. The first impression here is not a great one, and we start to see small ways that the originals were more polished. I didn't play this on an original Xbox, but otherwise there are no more issues caused by the 360 than I'm aware of, and it does output better video. Aesthetically, you get all the environments from 1 and 2, so there's even more variety than each game alone. While there are some repeating themes, I think it emphasizes some subtle differences in the art direction between both games, such as the detailed, lively, and grounded Monkey Ball 2 world versus the simple, colorful, and abstract ones from the first game, but they still blend together pretty well due to the simple geometry creating that abstract atmosphere for both. And with some standard desert and ice themes alongside unconventional ones like the factory and amusement park, the level variety is really rounded out here. The UI and menus are also carried over from Monkey Ball 2, which hold up great as ever, looking stylized and thematic yet organized. And while the cutscenes look bad, the rest of the presentation's fine. The new title screen is the natural evolution of the previous ones, which get lusher and more full with each game. And the American box art is also one of my favorites having expressive classic renders and a great composition. That's the kind of polish that a premium definitive package should have. Unfortunately, it seems like they couldn't get the dual product placement, so it's actually a 0 out of 10. I mean, how else would I know what bananas to buy if my monkey game didn't tell me? Your appeal to ethos can't get stronger than that. Anyway, the soundtrack makes up for it. Kind of. Both games still have great music with this upbeat yet immersive mix of synth and dance beats. We know this. However, remember in Monkey Ball Jr. how some of the areas had the wrong music? Well, they did that in Deluxe for literally no good reason. So, Arctic plays the sky theme. Which also plays in the sky world. And now Arctic plays in the SMB1 space world. So the same song plays twice, and one is removed. Now I love the Arctic theme, and I actually think it works well in the space world, but like, just play Arctic twice or keep the music untouched. The minigames also only use the second game's music, which doesn't exactly preserve all the content, does it? At worst, these are nitpicks, but it is a little jarring. There's also one really strange audio issue. I never really talked about the ball rolling sound, but you only miss it when it's gone. That whirling sound is addictive, unique, and complements the abstract structure, making the game stand out. But in Deluxe, the monkeys roll in complete silence. It's very jarring to play, especially when there are collision sounds, which makes me wonder if it's a bug or intentional. Still a banger of a soundtrack, but with some strange quirks that take the polish off that aren't there if you play the game separately. But enough looking at the thing. These nitpicks must be trivial due to the sheer amount of content in the game, right? Well, Super Monkey Ball Deluxe fundamentally changes a lot of the experience, so it's not just a combo pack. Story Mode has seen some simple yet appreciated gameplay improvements despite the cutscenes. Each world has been expanded to 20 levels, and you can pick any 10 to progress. For a mode that's all about sampling levels, you get to pick from a variety of vastly different challenges. Some people may wish to play all 20 levels in a world, and it would be cool if that factored into some kind of reward, but the deluxe story mode has a lot of replay value, allowing you to pick even more different routes. 
If I were to make some changes, it would have been cool to see the Monkey Ball 1 worlds integrated into some new ridiculous plot points and cutscenes, which would add a lot to the story and make Deluxe stand out more. Running the risk of dragging it out, and considering what we got though, I'm still satisfied. And like I said about variety, you can really see how different the level design from each game is. On top of the speed and timing based levels of 2, all the concise, balance based levels of the first game are here, on top of some brand new levels. This is where you could suspect that a cancelled Monkey Ball 3 was reworked into Deluxe. Nagoshi has stated that Deluxe does include some levels that were scrapped from the originals, and some new stages feel right out of the first game. As far as we know, there are probably some scrapped Monkey Ball 1 levels here, but the actual new levels come in the form of these large boxy maze-like structures. If these were from a third game, it's clear that scale was their core focus. They wanted to make some giant areas for you to roll around in, to varying degrees of success. As standalone levels, the new stages are pretty hit or miss, with a lot of large, flat, simple mazes. Some still have interesting ideas though, such as this escalator one. I have the same sentiment that I do for the more gimmicky Monkey Ball 2 levels like spinning top with these. Not every level has to be super difficult, because too much at once is overwhelming without a break. As long as I'm seeing and doing interesting things, I'm still having fun, and these levels work in between the more difficult stages with the right balance. In challenge mode, they also serve the purpose of fixing the banana deficit. Alongside the bonus stages, more side levels with opportunities for bananas balances the difficulty design, as risking 100 bananas for 10 is way too demanding in most cases. See, you have to take into account the holistic experience alongside the individual levels that compose it and under that lens, they are a welcome addition. But the levels from the first two games are clearly the meat here, and if you weren't a fan of 2 compared to 1, I think you're more likely to enjoy Deluxe. SMB1 levels are more skill-based and straight to the point, often being simpler but more difficult. It's all about precise movement on narrow paths and moving blocks. Still a lot of variety, but they do more with less and focus around simpler obstacles. For an arcade game with limited credits, they can't introduce too much at once, so they masterfully fleshed out a simple set of mechanics and ideas to a natural conclusion. There's a level of simple elegance here that is completely valid to prefer. Being a natively console experience, 2 went in a different direction with a more forgiving structure, but more ambitious level design. The levels tend to focus on a single challenge based around building up speed and conquering an obstacle with the right timing. They're much more open-ended as a result, rewarding out-of-the-box thinking. Some levels in 2 have that SMB1 elegance, but some people will prefer the first game's simplicity over gimmicks and puzzles. For me, I like the creative movement of 2 and the better presentation of the content, so the experience is better for me, but both have their own focus and it's valid to prefer either. Combined together in Deluxe, you get the best of both worlds. The two styles complement each other very well since the controls are still about momentum and precision, so the level design is non-stop variety and creativity. 300 stages in this one. They even gave names to the stages from the first game to make them fit in more. The only missing level is the last level of Master Extra, for obvious reasons. Instead of a GameCube, it's a rotating dice. Having to navigate the pockets as the dice rotates is probably better communication to the player, but I can't help prefer the complex geometry and novelty of the GameCube as the final level in the game. Otherwise, the content here is unparalleled, and Super Monkey Ball Deluxe is the sort of game that will keep you coming back for years to master it. But while the content is there, it's about how it's paced, which brings me to challenge mode. Similar to the previous entries, you tackle a series of levels across each difficulty in a limited number of lives and continues. It builds up the Monkey Ball 2 structure of upgradable lives, up to 99 per continue. This creates a sense of progression as your margin of error increases alongside the challenge, which is a fair and balanced way to go about it. And with 300 stages, each difficulty level has been significantly lengthened. Advanced mode in the originals was a brisk stroll of 30 stages compared to beginner's 40 in this one. And expert mode has been doubled to a colossal 100 stages. And if you beat a difficulty without a continue, you get another 20 levels tacked on as well. Beginner actually surprised me here, being a mere warm-up before, but having a lot more substance in Deluxe, with the extras holding some weight due to the lower life count at this point in the game. But the lives are where Deluxe falls apart, with the removal of the playpoint system, which was the glue that held the completion experience together and made it satisfying in the first place. Now you're rewarded for fulfilling fixed conditions. 
All the mini games are unlocked from the start. The movies unlock as you view them in the story. Both credits mini games are unlocked after you first play them, and you're rewarded with extra lives for just kind of playing the game. You get them in bunches that exponentially increase in value, but these payouts come seemingly at random, and it's not transparent at all compared to the direct feedback of the playpoint system, which was based on your score. I think it either has to do with score or levels completed, as you seem to get more from higher difficulties. The problem is that, while I like how beginner is a little bit harder, advanced and expert are way too long for how little lives you'll have at that point. And the controls don't help much either. The GameCube stick was very sensitive, and the notches allowed for unparalleled angular precision. On the Xbox and PS2, it's harder to hold exactly forward, for example, due to the circular edge around the stick giving you any one of 360 degrees. Overall, the controls feel less sensitive and responsive, so you don't get the same level of control as you do on GameCube. Depending on how much that matters to you, Deluxe might be a clear downgrade. The more open stages from 2 and Deluxe play fine, but it's the super narrow paths of the first game that suffer, which were already hard enough in the original. Not to blame the game, because I really do love the challenge and have completed it. But the less precise controls and stingier live system do make the game super frustrating. 5 or 6 lives is way too low for a 70 or 100 stage run when you attempt the extra levels like this. While I can beat most of these levels on their own, challenge mode is more of a test of stamina, so it's not reasonable without a lot of lives to balance it. With stages like Exam C that eat up lives at the beginning of the run due to the genuine difficulty and worse controls determining if you're worthy of proceeding. If you could gain lives faster, the difficulty would feel balanced like in 2 since directly being rewarded based on your score and performance decreases how much you'll have to replay each difficulty. I'm fine with some repetition, that's how you get better at these games, but Monkey Ball Deluxe makes you repeat these hour-long modes for the chance of a small life payout. I can't stress enough how much this goes over the line. I got to the point where I just couldn't get to Advanced Extra without some more lives, and the full 99 for Expert Extra and Master. It was either grind expert for the greater chance of more lives, or play the same 70 levels of advanced again to try to progress. I was wasting my time either way, repeating levels I had already mastered to try a few difficult ones way too often. But determined as I was, I kept throwing myself at this game to master it while grinding for lives, which was not fun in the slightest. That's the experience I had with Monkey Ball Deluxe. It was grindy and not rewarding with its stingy life system. Sure, there are stakes and you value lives more, but when the targeted challenge is unreasonable with those lives, it becomes overkill. Sometimes bigger isn't always better. More content is great a lot of the time, but there's a fine line between how much a game offers and how well it's paced out. It doesn't matter how much there is to do, but how much fun I have doing it. I don't want to take away from the fact that difficulty is a staple of these games. I enjoy the challenging and creative level design, clearly enough to make it through this game despite the worst controls and grindy pacing. But it wasn't fun, and after a point, was only done out of obligation. 
Deluxe is better than Monkey Ball 1 due to the improvements of 2, but despite having more content, I felt like I was overcoming more meaningful challenges in 2 than wasting my time in Deluxe. There isn't even all that much to unlock anymore. Because these games get marketed increasingly more as a party experience, having the minigames available from the beginning is understandable for people who don't care about the main game, but for me, I enjoy unlocking stuff and feeling rewarded, so Deluxe has very little of a satisfying completion experience. Story mode has no rewards outside of the movies, so while the structure has more variety, you actually get rewarded in two with play points. I think I got one life from Deluxe's story mode or something. There is one meaningful addition to challenge mode, however. Completion of Expert unlocks the brand new Ultimate mode, a marathon of every mode back to back, all 300 stages if you don't use a continue. This is the Ultimate Monkey Ball Challenge. Nothing has ever come close. Luckily, you can save between categories, even when you reach the extra stages. I was actually really excited for this mode, but it basically became how many lives can I retain before getting to expert mode, where you can just save and reset if you mess up. It's a cool mode, but you don't get anything from it even if you beat every difficulty in under 99 lives to reach master extra. No thanks, <laughs> I was already pretty much done by that point. I think I actually would have preferred if it was like Double Dash's All Cup Tour mode, where there was an element of randomization, maybe a save point for every certain number of levels or something. I like this mode, but it doesn't offer much that I couldn't just get by finishing Master Extra. And speaking of Master, guess whose favorite stage is back? So to get to Master Extra, you have to beat Bridge Master with an imprecise analog stick. Have fun. I sure did. I spent hours retrying these 20 stages just to get to this point, and this skip was such a so close yet so far moment. I also made it worse for myself because I was such a completionist and couldn't help myself, so after I accidentally took the warp and synchronized, I spent hours retrying the mode to get past the blue goal. It was absolute insanity. Despite that, I do like that the SMB1 Master Stages are in a more balanced game, and it was satisfying to actually have stakes and get good at them. As much as I don't like the difficulty balance and the pacing for the rest of the game, I will say that the satisfaction you get from beating Advanced Extra, Expert Extra, and Master Extra is unparalleled by most games I've played. But Deluxe is so frustrating because of stuff like this. It's not the definitive version, and people will have different mileage with it. The pacing is frustrating, but I can't discount the amount of content. It's the kind of game you could spend years playing due to how fun the core gameplay is, and it isn't necessarily meant for a completionist like myself. Maybe I'm being very critical of it, but my problems lie from a buildup of small issues that aren't there if you play the game separately, especially two. Deluxe presents one's content better, but has issues that make the extra content feel like a burden on the experience. The content that is from 2 is good enough in both 2 and Deluxe, but 2 does what it sets out to do better without the extra problems. For me, the concise experience is better moment to moment. Deluxe is great for some, but being a trade-off makes it fail as a definitive addition. Some people will be satisfied with the content alone though, and that's valid. And the minigames might have something to do with that. Now I'll confess that I've kind of brushed them to the side for these reviews, only playing a few matches here and there for my basic impressions, and then moving on. I don't have any nostalgic attachment to them, and only a little multiplayer experience. I actually miss a lot of the nuance added in 2 though, so the rest of this review will be the ultimate Super Monkey Ball minigame analysis, and I'll be looking at all of them in more depth. What am I getting myself into? The new minigames from 2 are unchanged but the games present in both 1 and 2 are combined into a deluxe version. Monkey Race has always been one of the best, so combining the stages from both games instantly makes it a classic. While it lacks the music of the first game, for some reason, you still get the spectacular music from 2. As I've said before, minigames are at their best when they feel consistent to the movement of the main game, but repurpose the momentum-based ball physics in a creative way. Race does just that. It controls a little stiffer than something like the competition mode, so tight turns, which they love to have, can be a little annoying. But for a side mode, it's packed with a lot of content, especially in Deluxe. Instead of having difficulties, there's a Grand Prix for each game. Race 1 has much simpler tracks than 2, lots of half pipes with obstacles on them. Good for beginners. This develops into the final couple of stages, which subvert the level design into some more crazy ideas and layouts, such as the AV level, or the cylindrical space level. Race 2 builds on this with more stages that I can identify focus design for, such as unique shapes, 
certain types of obstacles, or a unique layout such as this underwater one with alternate paths. Race 2 is an evolution of 1, and combined together, they create a natural difficulty progression with tons of content. The item balance is very Mario Kart-y, and includes a lot of homing attacks that do different things. The items don't feel all that useful though, and the mode doesn't exactly do much mechanically to create a skill ceiling. It's varied and in-depth for a side mode, but still only shallow and chaotic fun. For replayability, you do have some time trials and quick races, no single player rewards though, and it would have been nice to slowly unlock this content as I played it. Throwing it at me all at once is my biggest problem with the minigames in general. It gets a little overwhelming. Anyway, moving on. Monkey Fight Deluxe is a similar story, where you get the item sets and stages from both games, minus one jungle stage since they're nearly identical anyway. This was one of the highlights from the first game, and two actually improves upon the controls, allowing you to punch in any direction with the tap of the right stick and charge with the B button, adding a lot of freedom. While the power-ups are very similar across both, with the Big Punch and Iron Punch technically being different but serving the same purpose, Fight Deluxe makes for a chaotic and fun time with tons of options and content. A bit more shallow than Race, but its simplicity makes me okay with the solely multiplayer focus that is good for short bursts. As it is, Fight is one of the best modes, if not for a slight game-breaking bug. While the main mode where you gain points by punching opponents off the edge works, there is another mode in survival mode, where the last player standing wins. Credit to the PS2 version, it works. But for some reason, survival is literally unplayable on my copy on the 360. Could be multiple factors, sure, disc or emulation, but survival mode just doesn't load and the game solve locks. I can't find if this is a known issue, and I'd love to know if anyone else has had this problem, or if it's just my disc. Otherwise, Fight DX is almost one of the best minigames. Monkey Target is a fan favorite, and as has been the case thus far, it has a lot to love, with some setbacks that make me scratch my head. Basically, you can choose whether or not to play the targets from one or two. Each has their own ramp, target layouts, and mechanics. In one, you spin a wheel at the beginning of each turn that determines obstacles such as wind or floating bombs, and between rounds you can use items to tip the odds in your favor. Two changes things up quite a bit and is a lot more streamlined. There's no wheel, and you collect power-ups as you glide. With skilled aerial movement, you can get item magnets, double points, increased traction, and stuff like that. To me, 2 is an improvement that removes the fluff and focuses more on skill. Having the option to choose is good though. Even separately, Target has some of the most replayability in single player to get the high score and master it. The gliding physics are satisfying and there's a wide variety of creative layouts. 2 even lets you control multiple monkeys at once to freshen things up. But because this is Monkey Ball Deluxe, something has to be wrong. And in this case, the water doesn't load. As is standard on GameCube, the water in Target 1 and 2 was some high quality stuff. And Target DX is so jarring to play because of this. Once again, it has the content, but lacks the polish. Remember when I said that I'm not here to analyze billiards? Well, guess what time it is. Like I said about minigames getting overwhelming, Billiards has a lot of rules and a lot of modes, and generally takes longer to play than the other ones. You have single matches and tournament mode. The four rule sets are US and Japan 9-ball, rotation, and 8-ball. In US 9-ball, you have to shoot the cue ball at the numbered ball of the lowest value. The goal is to start at 1 and work your way up to 9. However, if you say shoot the white ball at the 1, and the 1 ricocheted off the 9, sending it into a pocket, then you automatically win. Stuff like that creates a lot of depth. Japan 9-Ball is a little more hectic, but builds off the same rule set. You still hit the lowest numbered ball, but instead of working your way up to the 9, you accumulate points based on the ball you hit and the pocket it lands in. With up to 4 players, there's a lot going on here, and a lot more strategy with getting the most out of one hit to maximize points and mess with your opponents. However, both modes are a bit too slow and boring to me. And maybe that's the point of having games with varying pace and style. Although I actually did find more fun out of Rotation and 8-Ball, which were added alongside Japan 9 in the second game. In Rotation, you have 15 balls and have to hit the smallest numbered ball, but you get points equal to the number of the ball you pocket, with the victor being the first to 60 points. It's less complex, but more open-ended. There's more you can do with each turn, and balls 1 through 8 don't feel useless. It's the chaos of Japan 9, but more digestible. And I enjoyed this one. 8 ball is also an interesting twist. There are 15 balls on the table, with 1 through 7 being the low group and 9 through 15 being the high group. You get the group of the first ball you hit, and you have to pocket all those balls before the 8 ball, which decides the winner. 
but if you pocket the 8 ball before then, you lose. It has a unique sense of strategy, and I actually enjoyed this one, with both players operating separately but being able to mess with each other. While Billiards doesn't reinvent the wheel and add its own depth, the charm is added by the visuals and sound as well as how the focus on angles and momentum is repurposed for Monkey Ball. There's even a lot of challenge as each AI monkey has their own strategy, from being all round to preferring angles, or power shots, or shooting directly at the ball. With two lively and charming backgrounds taken from both games, some relaxing music, tons of modes, challenging AI, and a lot of strategy, while it's not for me, there is an appeal here, and Billiards has its place. There, there's your Billiards analysis. Moving on. Anyways, Monkey Bowling is a little bit more my speed, and is another highlight. I definitely glossed over how much Bowling 2 adds to the first one, because at the surface, it looks the same with a different background. So you've got your standard and challenge mode like the first game, now with a 9-pin option on top of the regular 10-pin setup alongside a few slightly new challenge formations from the second game, but 2 also adds Special Mode and Strike Mode. Strike Mode limits you to one turn per frame, and is a good way to practice getting strikes. Special Mode, on the other hand, finally adds some meat to these party games. Each frame in a level has a different lane, with warped and moving layouts. It's really creative and something unique that only this type of game could offer. That instantly makes it stand out from a more realistic bowling simulator. There are even two extra unlockable levels if you can get high enough score. These are very difficult, requiring near perfection on each layout. It's a little tedious to have to replay these lanes, but at least there is an incentive to master each course. As of Monkey Ball 2, each character also has unique stats. Ai is the all-rounder, Mimi has sharper spinning but lower speed, Baby has a low speed, slower turning but better aiming, and Gon Gon has a high speed but low spin. I enjoy the risk and reward of these varied playstyles. From the puzzles of challenge mode, to the platforming of stages of special mode, to the replayable standard mode, and the cathartic strike mode, bowling is fun to master in both single and multiplayer. Like in the originals, it is yet another way to spin off the precise, momentum-based ball physics into a fun and challenging side mode. It takes a realistic concept and adds its own mechanic via the spin to allow the player more control while designing challenges around that control. Top tier one right here. And they just keep knocking it out of the park. Another great one is golf. It's like a more fun version of billiards that combines the precise aiming with the obstacle courses of the main game. However, it's also the most different between 1 and 2. Monkey Golf 1 is more like mini golf, with a set of small obstacle courses, while Monkey Ball 2 is more like normal golf. Much larger courses with clubs that hit far longer distances. It's more about hitting as far as possible and zeroing in on the goal, with more general obstacles like the void, trees, and rough terrain, alongside wind to shake things up. Golf Deluxe benefits from the upgrade a lot more than most others as a result combining entire styles of gameplay rather than just levels to flesh out the mode. As a Monkey Ball minigame, I prefer the first one. The mini golf courses just suit the core gameplay better and offer more memorable and tightly designed challenges. Regular golf fits more with Chu's philosophy of larger, more open-ended stages, but it feels more like each turn matters in Golf 1. In a turn-based game, I think that works better. Regular golf is a bit too samey and the gameplay is a bit stretched out. Both are decent enough portrayals of their real-life counterparts with responsive controls, but I prefer mini golf in my own subjective taste. And that's about it for the deluxe minigames. The remaining ones are straight ports of Monkey Ball 2. Monkey Boats is a gimmicky alternative to race where you alternate the shoulder buttons to paddle through each course. This is where we move away from the core ball mechanics. A lot of these are spin-offs of other minigames rather than the core gameplay, so they feel a lot less consistent, but can be good on their own. Boats has three stages with a Grand Prix, single race, and time trial. While there are less courses, I do like the interconnectivity. This is one waterway with each course being a different route. There's a sense of progression through larger and more difficult sectors of this river, culminating in a very fun third level. Especially the end section. Cathartic stuff. I wish I had some new stages for Deluxe, because it's very short, but for a more gimmicky mode, it doesn't overstay its welcome. And maybe that's for the best, because it's very slow and sluggish to play. On top of that, the item balance kinda sucks. There are too many red shell clones, and the speed boosts don't feel very... fast? So the flow of the race is you get hit with stuff, can't defend, and don't have many ways to catch up. The controls and speed items don't really help enough, and the AI is very tough. It's short and shallow fun, but gets tedious as it has a very low skill ceiling. A deluxe could have improved it, but didn't, so it's the same as in 2 and good enough, but not great. Monkey Shot surprised me though. 
I really brushed it off last time thinking, oh they ran out of ideas, they just added a shooting gallery. But like, it actually has substance. The gameplay is simple, but there is content and even some mechanics here. While it fits the least, it actually does spin off of something from the core game, with the bosses being Bad Boon themed, and with each level being a world from story mode. It's not much, but they clearly had some kind of inspiration. They tried. And not for nothing either, it's kind of fun. You have three levels to unlock and progress through. As you move on rails with up to four players, you can shoot enemies on screen and pick up items. You have limited ammo and have to pick up more, so you have to manage your resources and quickly reload to maximize damage output. It takes less time to reload with some ammo left, so by getting good at that you can shoot faster than your teammates and get the high score. There's also two types of shots, a faster digital A button press, or a slower analog trigger press that has a homing property. Depending on the enemy, you'll want to use both shots to perform efficiently. With a few factors to manage and a decent difficulty progression, there is a skill ceiling here. And like I said, the bosses are bad boon robots, especially the final boss, this bad boon lion thing? I actually wish this was a sort of side story or something. Maybe a little cutscene showing these robots awakening in the doctor's lab after the events of the main game and wreaking havoc. Something more to tie the minigame in would help. As it stands, it's another short romp that accomplishes what it sets out to do very effectively. A very fun high score skill game both in single player and multiplayer. Monkey Dogfight is a spin-off of Target repurposing the gliding physics for a Star Fox 64 style shooting game. Similar to Boats, it has a unique concept, but not all that much content. But it's intended more for short bursts of multiplayer, like in Fight. You fly around shooting bullets and homing missiles, while trying to follow your opponent to lock on. It's not Star Fox 64 multiplayer, but creates its own feel by simulating physics. Your turning radius will change depending on how you tilt yourself and how the air pushes up on the glider. Aiming isn't nearly as snappy as something like Star Fox though, and you kind of just resort to spamming missiles to deal damage. The combat isn't the most balanced or mechanically fun as a result, even if the maneuvering is done pretty well. You have three stages and two modes, deathmatch and survival. The levels are all pretty open and if it weren't for the backgrounds and slight landmarks with differing item locations, they wouldn't impact the gameplay all that much. It's enough variety for a short and sweet mode though, and it's as good as it needs to be. My suggestion to make dogfight even better would have been to combine it with monkey shot. The dogfight mode would be the same, but there could also be an on rails mode where it's essentially monkey shot, but you control the monkeys in gliders in third person like a Star Fox level. And that would flesh out dogfight and make shot more consistent with the main game. And don't even say that's too derivative because look at the rest of these minigames. It's fine as it is with both modes being shallow fun, but that's just an interesting idea that I came up with to add some more depth. Monkey Soccer is where I start to check out. These last three are just generic sports with control styles that don't really use the ball based physics as well as the earlier ones. Soccer is basically FIFA, where you can choose different team formations and strategies and then play a game of soccer. I've never cared for these top-down sports simulators, as they feel too clunky and lack any sense of mechanical satisfaction. I hate how you randomly switch between players on the field. It feels like you don't have any time to make any meaningful movements. You basically just kick off, defend, bring the ball up the field, pass or shoot. The monkey ball doesn't really add much and the controls feel slow and sluggish. Choosing team strategies adds some depth, with different characters having different attributes. Ai Ai and Mimi are all around, Gon Gon is defensive, and Baby is offensive. That adds some depth, but the base game is so bland that it falls short of being interesting. Penalty Kick Mode is a fun little battle of angles though. You take turns either running the ball up and kicking, or moving the goalie to block. But that's about it. Otherwise, you have tournament mode or a single exhibition match. Now it's basically the same between 2 and Deluxe with one difference. Once again, could be my disc, but it is unplayable on Deluxe on the 360. During the match, for some reason, the game randomly softlocks with a cut to black and a constant punching noise like the players randomly start beating each other up and the network cuts the video feed to censor it. But yeah, soccer was unplayable for me on the 360 and maybe for you too? Next, baseball. So for this one, you either take control of the batter or pitcher. As the batter, you can adjust your position and hit the ball. Your goal is to aim either for a home run ramp or a pocket that lets you run a select number of bases. Each time the field changes, a wheel is spun that determines the layout of the pockets and ramps. You also want to avoid hitting an outfielder or letting the ball stop short in the field. 
Otherwise, it's the same baseball rules. Three strikes and you're out, three outs and the field changes, most run wins. My biggest problem with Monkey Baseball is that it's way too one-sided in the favor of the outfielders. Half the time the ball just bounces behind me and results in a foul. When you do hit the ball, there are way too many obstacles and only a few narrow windows to get anywhere. While that's where the challenge comes from, I don't feel in control of the ball. On the other hand, the pitcher has so many more options to troll the batter. You can slow down, speed up, and add a curve to your trajectory. When pitching against the CPU, slowing down and speeding up at the last second is a consistent way to assure that they will not hit the ball. Being the pitcher is the most fun of baseball, but it's also a big waste of time because you're not making any progress. As it stands, Baseball isn't a fun or a balanced party game. The most charm is in the backgrounds and character animations, like when I.I. crosses home base. And that's true for a lot of these minigames. But as a game, Monkey Baseball doesn't control well and there are a lot more interesting games to get good at. And finally, tennis is a massive mixed bag. It's blatantly trying to be Mario Tennis, but without everything that makes that game fun. You've got your single and doubles matches alongside a tournament mode, and various techniques to change the speed and trajectory of the ball, like the topspin, slice, lob shot, and star shot. However, it lacks polish and snappiness. The characters are way too clunky to move around, and their animations are way too slow. It just feels sloppy and unresponsive. In Mario Tennis, you can position your character in many different ways to add a curve to the ball depending on which swing you use. As a result, you could lure your opponent around and had some strategy. The moment-to-moment -moment volley of the ball was very fun. Those mechanics are there, but you have way less control, so the volley of the ball is less fluid. It feels like you can't get certain shots in time because the animations are too slow. Diving for the ball is less reliable, you move too slow, and you charge too slow. Sometimes power shots just straight up don't register. Overall, you don't have enough control over where your ball goes, making it way too easy to send the ball out of bounds. It just doesn't have the elegance of its inspiration and no original twist or uniqueness. I do like the chords, animations, and music though. Each chord has different terrain to affect the way the ball bounces, and they take place in unique locations that expand the world. That part is done right, but it's way too frustrating to play, and it's just not Monkey Ball. The competition mode also has some missed potential. In Monkey Ball 1, it was a separate mode where you could pick a set of stages and race to the finish with multiple players at once. It was a very fun mode, arguably the best in multiplayer. In 2 though, it was replaced with taking turns in challenge mode. Deluxe basically has both, but limits competition mode to Monkey Ball 1 stages. It's not much more than you'd get separately, and it's good enough, but is some weird missed potential in Deluxe. I guess the stages with switches could be broken with multiple players, but that might make them more hectic. If not, just exclude a few stages and keep most of them. Still a good time, but Deluxe kind of does the bare minimum with its competition mode. But overall, it's clear that there's a wide variety of minigames with tons of different appeals. You have some that are closer in line to the main game, and some that are a bit more general. I can understand why they would include the sports ones, but this is a case where more doesn't always equal better. Like I said, they could have combined Dogfight and Shot into one unique minigame that, while derivative of another game, would still have that monkey ball spin due to the gliding physics. These games have always been advertised as a party experience, so it's understandable to try to add more value for those that don't come for the main game. But the more games they add, the less creative they get. I love the party games that focus on the main mechanics, because there's usually a lot more depth there. I would have preferred less minigames and more fleshed out ones, instead of a lot of shallow ones. I mean, they don't really take away from the main game, so I don't care too much personally, but there's a lot of missed potential when actually sitting down to play them. Deluxe could have added some original content and improvements to fix some of these, but unfortunately it didn't. And in some ways, there are issues with the combined versions that simply aren't there if you were to play each separately. That is my takeaway from Super Monkey Ball Deluxe. It really can't be understated how much content there is in the game. As much as I say some minigames feel shallow, that is on top of 300 levels and very well developed mechanics. However, there are enough issues that make it feel less polished than 1 and 2 separately. Sure, some new things were added, but the new levels only supplement the old ones and aren't that great on their own. Playing the GameCube games separately, you technically get the same amount of content with better controls and less glitches. Monkey Ball 1's pacing withstanding. The PS2 version is easily the worst Monkey Ball game I've played yet, considering the standard. And the Xbox version's good, but with a few of its own issues and structural issues across both. There's a lot to do, but the experience is paced tediously with less rewards and more grinding. 
I'd probably still play Deluxe for all the improvements from 2 despite the controls, but that's the problem. Nothing about Deluxe is unique to it. All the improvements are derivative of Monkey Ball 2. As a result, if you care about the experience of these games and enjoy the style of level design that 2 goes for, then I'd say it's the more enjoyable holistic experience, even though it doesn't have the content from the first game. If you thought the second game lacked that simplistic skill-based challenge of the first game, then I'd say to play Deluxe because the first game is way too demanding to be accessible nowadays, unless you're really a stickler for controls. It's really disappointing though. Yet again we're playing 1 and 2 and we don't have a clear definitive experience before moving things forward. But this is where things get interesting, and where Amusement Vision starts to leave the picture. We have tons of experimental games ahead, many that are disliked quite a bit. Could there be anything salvageable here? Well, this is uncharted territory for me, so I guess I'll find out. In the meantime, go play some Monkey Ball 2, and have a great day.